This meeting is being recorded. Hey, everybody. Hope you all are well. This is Marley Kay. I am here today to talk to you about an unpopular topic, male inequality. And I know I'm going to probably get some pushback from people um, about this topic, but I don't care. I'm here to talk about the truth. And it is a personal um, journey for me because uh, being a woman, a black woman in America and having raised three sons, uh, I have three grandsons, I have brothers, I have a father, I have plenty of male friends and I have listened to them over the years about how difficult it is for men. I have seen it play out. I have seen how all these systems that we have have been crafted to work against men, it, beginning from you know pu the public school system and how it operates. It's you know predominantly uh, female led, female run. Um, you have you know maybe more men in administration, but you have more female teachers. These female teachers don't always have experience. Most do not have experience working with males. Um, our school system is not set up or developed to take into account the differences in the way that the male and female brain develops. And they have not crafted systems or uh, accommodations or learning styles to accommodate the differences. And so what you see is a lot of, um, you know, things that boys do in school, uh, teachers tend to focus on behavior and, and with girls, they don't necessarily do that. And it's because, you know, females mature earlier than boys do. And with even with all this information, like nothing in our system or society has changed. And, you know, take into account this shift to have this female dominated society where, you know, women are encouraged to get more education, to run things. And this society has made all sorts of preferences to accommodate women to the detriment of men and boys. It is evident now with the manosphere. I don't know if you listen to any of the, in the, in any of the things that are coming out of the manosphere. I do. I don't necessarily agree with everything. I don't always agree with the tone and the language used to describe the, the issues and the disappointment and the disrespect, but they are real concerns. And, you know, people tend to think that, you know, you have to choose, you have to be on a team, it's either or, either you're for this or you're not for this. And I, I can agree that, you know, this society is built on a different type of way uh, we treat women, or it used to be. But after the 60s and 70s and this feminism, women's movement started, things have been totally different. Women now don't necessarily need men and Women now can do a lot of things that men used to do. Space has been made, accommodations have been made, uh, priorities have been made to focus on, accommodate, support women at the detriment of men. And so, you know, a lot of people listen to listen will be listening to this and only hear I'm supporting men. But in this piece that I'm getting ready to read to you in this video that I'm going to play in its entirety, you're going to see data that supports what I'm saying about the male inequality. And then if you choose to ignore it, you know, that's on you. But I want to bring it to the forefront so that we can begin to think differently and look at men and boys differently. Because right now our society looks at men and boys as if, hey, they're boys, they're just supposed to get it. Like there's supposed to be some type of 
download into their spirits and minds and they're supposed to know how to do everything and we don't have to pour into them. Meanwhile, we spend our whole entire lives crafting all these fairy tales and all this stuff for women and girls. And when you look at how how we treat women and girls, you know, from K through 12, all throughout society, and then you look at how we treat boys, you know, it's just totally different. So the inequality is obvious, but what it has led to, it has led to the breakdown of our society. It's the reason that we have this rift between the men and the women. It's also the reason that, you know, in my opinion, the West in America is a failed state. You see the more push for feminist and feminine feminism, it, it's just not helpful to society. No, nobody likes it. You know, you have the old school women like me who don't like it. We see that it is problematic. It destroys the order of how functioning, thriving civilizations operate. And even in that, um, Studies have found, I know uh, I talked about this study one time before by J.D. Unwin, how, you know, anytime a society shifts to a more sexually liberated, female oriented uh, society, within three generations, that society fails or begins to fail. And we're at the third and the cusp of the fourth generation where females have been dominating our society. You look at Congress, you know, they brag about how many women are in Congress. Everything is about women. Um, you know, tech, they're trying to get more women in tech. Uh, corporate America, they're trying to get more women in corporate America. Everything is, is centered around women and girls at the detriment or exclusion of men and boys. And so you have this inequality, which has led to a lot of men being disgruntled, men feel worthless, men feel as though nobody cares about them. And they are going, you know, it's not going to be good for us going forward. And so I want to talk about it because this is this is our future. This is what we have to look forward to. And so if we don't shift our thinking and begin to support men and try to fix some of these issues that that we've if we didn't create them directly, we supported them by, you know, with our silence or just being ignorant to how systems and societies work and how most of the world and the, the history of the world has been run and created by men, not by women. So um, I'm going to play this video for you and then... I'm going to give my commentary afterwards, but let me read this. It's, this piece is um, on the Big Think. It is by Richard V. Reeves, and he's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and he directs the class, the the Future of the Middle Class Initiative, and he does something with uh, the Center of Children and Families. So the title of this piece is is called the mind blowing stats on male inequality. Boys and men are falling behind. This might seem surprising to some people and maybe ridiculous to others, considering that discussions on gender disparities tend to focus on the structural challenges faced by girls and women, not boys and men. But long term data reveal a clear and alarming trend. In recent decades, American men have been faring increasingly worse in many areas of life, including education, workforce participation, skills acquisition, wages, and fatherhood. Gender politics is often framed as a zero sum game. That is any effort to help men takes away from women. But in this 2022 book of boys and men, Journalist and Brookings Institution scholar Richard V. Reeves argues that the structural problems contributing to male malaise affects everybody and that shying away from these tough conversations is not a productive path forward, which I wholeheartedly agree, which is why I'm talking about it. Um, I know a, a lot of times women 
don't talk about these types of things because we get pushback from feminists and from other women. We, we should be siding with women. But baby, I got sons. I have a father that I love. I have a brother. I have you know, two brothers. I have male friends that I care about. And so, you know, I'm for the sisterhood to a certain extent, but I have a line and I'm not going to ignore the truth of the matter. And that is that, you know, women have advantages today in all sorts of ways that men do not have. And a lot of times women use those systems and things in place against men, almost like with a vendetta. So let's get into this video by Richard B. Reeves and we'll talk about it at the end. Oh, great, a commercial. A number of people warned me against writing a book about boys and men because it's such a fraught subject, particularly in politics right now, and because so many people were afraid that merely drawing attention to the problems of boys and men was implying somehow less effort being paid to girls and women, that it's framed as zero sum. And it's sort of a whose side do you want question, and you have to be on one side or the other rather than just being on the side of human flourishing. One of the real challenges here is that if there are men missing from certain crucial areas of our society and our economy, that makes it harder for other men and boys to flourish in those areas. We have an education system that has a dearth of male teachers. We have a labor market where the jobs that are growing fastest are ones where we have the fewest men. And in families, there's the growth in what you might call the dad deficit or fatherlessness. As men are struggling in each of those areas, what you'll see is it'll be harder for other men to follow in their footsteps. It's harder for boys to flourish if their fathers aren't engaged. It's harder for men to enter occupations where there aren't men. It's harder for boys to do well at school where there are no male teachers to be seen. And so there's a very real danger that unless we act quite soon, that we will set in train, something of a vicious cycle. I'm Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and my latest book is Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why That Matters, and What to Do About It. The overall picture is that on almost every measure, at almost every age, and in almost every advanced economy in the world, the girls are leaving the boys way behind, and the women leaving the men. What nobody expected was that girls and women wouldn't just catch up to boys and men in education, but would blow right past them and keep going. Everyone was very focused, quite rightly, on getting to gender equality, getting to gender parity. It's not that long ago where there was a huge gender gap the other way, and there was huge focus, correctly, in the 70s and 80s to really promote women and girls in education. But the line just kept going. And nobody predicted that. Nobody was saying, what if gender inequality reemerges in just as big a way as now, in some cases bigger, but the other way around? And to some extent, everyone's still trying to get their head around this new world where, at least in education, when you talk about gender inequality, you're pretty much always talking about the ways in which girls and women are ahead of boys and men. And that's happened in a very, very short period of human history. So if you look at the US, for example, in the average school district in the US, girls are almost a grade level ahead of boys in English and have caught up in math. If we look at those of the highest GPA scores, the top 10%, two thirds of those are girls. If we look at those at the bottom, two thirds of those are boys. When it comes to going to college, there's a 10 percentage gap in college enrollment, a similar size gap in completing college, conditional on enrolling. And the result of those trends is that the gender gap in getting a college degree is now wider than it was in 1972, but the other way around. So in 1972, when Title IX was passed to promote more gender equality in education, there was a 13 percentage point gap in favor of men getting college degrees. Now there's a 15 percentage point gap in favor of women getting college degrees. So the gender inequality we see in college today is wider than it was 50 years ago. It's just the other way around. There's quite a fierce debate about the differences between male and female brains. And in adulthood, I think 
there's not much evidence that the brains are that different in ways that we should worry about or that are particularly consequential. But where there's no real debate is in the timing of brain development. It is quite clear that girls' brains develop more quickly than boys' brains do, and that the biggest difference seems to occur in adolescence. So what happens is in adolescence, we develop what neuroscientists call the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex of our brain is sometimes known as the CEO of the brain. It's the bit of your brain that says you should do your chemistry homework rather than going out to party. It's the bit of your brain that says it is worth maintaining a high GPA because it will help you get to college, which might help you in the future. And that bit of the brain develops considerably earlier in girls than in boys, between one and two years earlier partly because girls go into puberty a bit earlier than boys, and that seems to trigger some of this development. What that means is that if you have an education system that rewards the ability to turn in homework, stay on task, worry about your GPA, prepare for college and so on, then just structurally, that's going to put an advantage the group whose brains have developed earlier in those particular areas. That turns out on average to be girls. I think it's a great irony of women's progress that by taking the brakes off women's educational opportunities and aspirations, we've revealed the fact that the education system is slightly structured against boys and men because of these differences in the timing of brain development. But it took the, the women's movement to show that because the natural advantages of women in education were impossible to see when women's aspirations were being capped by a sexist society. Now that those caps have been largely removed, we can see that it's boys and men who are at a disadvantage in the education system. At the risk of sounding boring, let's collect the data first so we know what we're dealing with here. I do think that we should be strongly encouraging boys to start school a year later than girls. I think that should become the default in many school districts because of the developmental gap that there is between boys and girls. Because boys' brains mature more slowly than them starting school a year later would mean that they were developmentally closer to being peers with the girls in the classroom. We need a lot more male teachers. It's striking that the teaching profession has become steadily more female over time. Only 24% of K-12 teachers now are male. That's down from 33% in the 80s. And fewer men are applying to teacher training year on year. And so we've seen this steady shift towards a close to an all-female environment. That has all kinds of consequences for the ethos of the school, for the way we deal with different kinds of behavior among boys and girls, for example. And so we need a very serious and intentional effort to get more men into teaching. The third thing I would do in this world where I have significant power to dictate policies would be significantly more investment in vocational education and training. That is an area where we do seem to see better results for boys and men on average and one that's woefully underinvested in in the US. The US has really bet most of its dollars on a very academic, a very narrow route towards success and less emphasis on vocational training. And that has actually put boys and men at a disadvantage. So apprenticeships, technical high schools are actually a really good way to help more boys and men. I think one of the challenges with this debate is that if you're talking to women and men who are, say, at the top of the economic ladder, four-year college degrees, decent incomes, they look around and they don't see some of these issues. But that's not the same for working class men. That's not the same for men lower down the economic ladder. So there's a danger that we're so busy, to borrow Sheryl Sandberg's phrase, so busy leaning in that we don't look down. The reality for men further down the ladder is very different. The economic trends for men have turned downwards along four dimensions. One is wages. Most men today earn less than most men did in 1979. In employment, with a drop in labor force participation of eight percentage points, which means nine million men now of prime age are not working, we've seen a drop in occupational stature. And so there are now more men working in employment areas which are seen as lower status than they were in the past. And we've also seen a drop in the acquisition of skills, the kinds of skills and education that boys and men need. If boys don't get educated and men don't get skilled, they will struggle in the labor market. And across all of those domains, we've seen a downwards turn for men in the last four or five decades. And so the way in which social class divides have opened up, economic inequality has widened, is really important to understand in the context of gender inequality. 
if we only focus on gender gaps, then we miss the fact that both men and women at the top have done increasingly well, but that's much less true of everybody else, and especially it's less true of those from lower income backgrounds, working class boys and men, and black boys and men. You see many of those trends are amplified, and so those boys and men are really at the sharpest end of many of the social and economic changes. On the one hand, we have a huge and successful and laudable effort to get more women into STEM jobs, so science, technology, engineering, and math. On the other side, we have what I call heel jobs. So that's health, education, administration, and literacy, almost if you like the opposite side of the coin to STEM jobs. And that's where a lot of the jobs are coming from. Health and education alone are huge and growing sectors in the US. And so by my estimates, for every one job we're gonna create in STEM between now and 2030, we're gonna create three in heel jobs. But those jobs are at least as gender segregated as STEM jobs, but in the other direction. And unlike STEM, becoming more so over time. So if you look at the heel sector, only 24% of the workers in those sectors are male. And that number is falling. And in particular sectors, we're seeing a really precipitous drop in the number of men. We have a drop in the number of male teachers. We have a very sharp drop in the number of male psychologists. That's dropped from 39% male to 29% male in the last decade alone. And among psychologists under the age of 30, only 5% are male. So we roll that forward and we're going to see psychology becoming essentially almost an all-female profession. So these jobs, which are both crucial, I think, for society and where it'd be very useful to have more diversity, are actually becoming more gender segregated. And so we have absolutely no effort to get more men into heel jobs, which is where I think the future lies and where we should be helping men to move. One of the problems that we face is what I call in the book a dad deficit. And that can be seen in various different ways. So one in four fathers don't live with their children. If parents split up, they're much more likely to lose contact with their fathers and with their mothers. And so one in three children, if their parents split up, don't see their father at all after a few years post the separation. So this fatherlessness is something that's very, very specific. And when four in 10 children are born outside marriage, and most children to less educated parents are born outside marriage, then we have to reinvent what it means to be a father. Because right now, men are still being held to an old standard of what it meant to be a successful father in a world where that is neither possible for many of them or even desirable. Because what we've seen is as women have grown in economic power and economic independence, then of course they're going to choose to be with a man rather than being forced to as in the old days. This is probably the greatest liberation in human history, honestly, that women can now choose whether to be with a man or not. More than two out of five households in the US now, a woman is the main breadwinner. 40% of American women earn more than the average man. These are huge economic changes and all for the good, but it does pose some really sharp questions about what fathers are for. And until we escape the obsolete model of the breadwinner father, then we will continue to see more and more men being left out of family life. And the kicker is that boys in families that don't have a father presence suffer much more than girls. And so then what happens is that male disadvantage can become intergenerational because if the fathers are struggling and therefore not really involved in their kids' lives, then the boys are the ones who suffer most, who will then go on to struggle themselves in education and the labor market. It's clear by now that marriage and social institutions and a sense of purpose matter to men. And so as we've seen these real challenges faced by men in education, work, and family, you're seeing some really difficult and troubling health consequences. And so the so-called deaths of despair from suicide, overdose, or alcohol, three times higher among men than among women. Suicide itself, three times higher among men and women and rising very quickly, especially among middle-aged men and younger men. So we can see these as symptoms, I think, of a broader malaise, which is what's troubling boys and men. And for men in particular, the sense of purpose is very important. I think it's a human universal that we need to be needed.
there's a wonderful piece of work by an academic called Fiona Shand who looked at the last words that men had used to describe themselves before committing suicide or attempting suicide. And the top of the list were worthless and useless. I think if we create a society in which so many men do feel like they're not needed, then it's no surprise that we see these deaths of despair. We see problems with opioids. Opioids are a much bigger problem for men than they are for women. And one of the great tragedies of opioid deaths is the death rates are higher in part because the users are on their own. And so in some ways, the opioid epidemic is a perfect illustration of a whole series of things we're talking about, which is a loss of role in the family, a loss of status in the labor market, turning to drugs and being isolated and withdrawn. And so in that example, I think you can see a symptom of this broader male malaise that we just need to take it more seriously. And we have a cultural responsibility as a society, men and women together, to help men and boys to adjust to this new world. Because right now, many of them are really struggling. Get smarter, faster with videos from the world's biggest thinkers. To learn even more from the world's biggest thinkers, Get Big Think Plus. All right. So you got the gist of what is going on. And so I I have seen this personally. I know um, men who have committed suicide unexpectedly, men that, you know, I thought were successful, doing okay. And it just blindsided me. I was completely shocked. Um, I'm seeing this... um, generation of middle-aged men really struggling and they are like really bitter and angry because you know they did everything that society said they they should do they work they got money they picked a wife but the wife because she earned she felt as though you know she Uh, didn't have to play the traditional role in the family or she didn't want to be the traditional wife that, you know, there's that strife uh, or or maybe sometimes a man was raised in a household without a male. And so he didn't necessarily know how to be a man and he had all these preconceived notions. And so there's that rub in the family, family split men always mostly most always, end up carrying the burden of the debts from the marriage, end up having to pay pay alimony, Um, they have children, they have to pay child support, and the majority of that, their income goes towards taking care of people that are not in their household, making it more difficult for them to survive. Leading to the despair that uh, Richard Reeves talked about in the video. So, you know, we have this vicious cycle that we're kind of ignoring, we're, we are blaming men and calling them angry without necessarily looking at the substance of their concern or their anger and frustration. Having grown up in a household with a mom who was one of those women who believed in using the court system against my dad, I am completely aware of how evil women can be, how we, you know, we get something said in our mind about doing some harm to somebody. I, I, I don't do this personally, but I, I know women who do and who have. You know, it's just really heart-wrenching to see what some men have to go through. And even when it comes to taking care of children, women weaponize children. Uh, we don't like each other, so you're not gonna see my child. It's my child, not like two people made the child. Or because you can't pay child support, or because you don't do, or, or just because you don't want me, the the mother of the child anymore, then I'm gonna withhold the child and not you, not allow you to give any affection to the child. I'm gonna move away to another place. I'm gonna find my child a new father, and that father is going to erase you. Like there are just so many different dynamics at work here that benefit women and disadvantage boys and men to where we're seeing all this manifest after these gen- three generations of these systems being set up to accommodate and support and enable women to advance at the um, at the detriment of, of men and boys. So as we look around and we see America falling and failing and crumbling look at look at men you know look at how 
you know, they're just not respected. They are not valued. And I'm not talking about high value men. When I say high value men, I'm talking about the six figure, seven figure men that you see plastered all over the internet. I'm just talking about the regular nobody men with a with no face, the guy at your grocery store, bagging groceries or the telephone man uh, or, uh, you know, somebody that works in some other industry that is invisible. Look at look at how boys are treated in school. Look at how men are treated in in college. And we don't pour into them the same way that we pour into girls. So you can't expect the same outcomes. Even with the school shootings, you look at how these boys are treated. They're either treated as adults and given things that they shouldn't have because their minds are not mature enough for those things, or they are infantilized and they are son husbands. You know, women who don't have men turn their sons and boys into their husbands and boy toys. And then they just send them out into the world and they just ruin the world for the rest of us. In any event, there are a lot of dynamics playing into this male inequality. And I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. Um, I would appreciate your feedback. Uh, you know, what are, what are your thoughts about what is going on? Do you know anybody that is experiencing these things? For me, I, I advocate for my grandchildren in school. They are Black males taught by white women. Already a problem. Um, people who have a racism issue, then they don't deal with men the same way because they don't take into consideration the way that the male brain develops as opposed to how the female or um, young girl brains develop. And so it's just challenging. Like it's, it's always a fight. If you have men in your life and boys in your life and you, you have been aware of this inequality all these years, um, I'm 50. My son, my oldest son is 32. So I've been going through, I've been fighting for 30 something years. And now I have another generation of young men that I am fighting for, my grandsons. So I'm fully aware and supportive of addressing the male inequality issue. But I, I would be interested in hearing, you know, your thoughts about your experiences, what you see or if you are just team female all the time, I'll even feel some of, of that. But at the end of the day, just know, no society stands without men building stuff. If men feel worthless, if men are not um, being used, that energy that they have to, to, to be used and to build things and to build societies and to make families, when, when that is taken away, your society fails. And again, I'm gonna put this study in the description from JD Unwin, you can read it, it's long. But if you, if you read the summary of it, it basically says the same thing. Any society that puts women before men has not, that we don't have one standing. Everyone that they've done what they're doing in America and in the West fails within three generations, possibly four. So we are there now, and um, you have to go back and look at the people who fought for um, feminism, w where feminism stemmed from. If you, you know, you know, and how devastating it is going to be to our society because it didn't have to be this way. Um, anytime you put, put women first, in, and not in order, let's say not first, but anytime there's a mismatch in the order of how, the natural order of things is what I like to say. The natural order of things is off and therefore our society is not gonna stand. So what you see today is a, is a mashup of what happens when you don't prioritize men and use men and make men feel like they're worth something. They walk around angry. They want to shoot up the schools. They, they want to abuse women. They don't want to build things. They don't want to work. They can't work because they don't have the skill sets because our society didn't pour into them the way that they've poured into girls. 
You know, you have the, the men at the top who only care about themselves and they don't care about the men at the bottom, which is the majority of our society. So this is really interesting to see this dynamic play out in this male inequality happening before our eyes. So um, just pay attention to the trends and give me your feedback. Uh, don't forget to like the video, share it and subscribe to the channel. And I look forward to reading your comments.